Good afternoon. As you guys uh, make your way in, uh, I figure we'll start on time so I can try to end on time. Uh, welcome to uh, the symposium on surrogates and caregivers and decision making across the lifespan. Uh, we have a great panel for you today. It's actually a WANL, WANL with uh, all women speakers, which is great. Um, and we're going to talk about medical decision making when uh, surrogate uh, decision makers and caregivers are involved. Um, we'll focus on methods and challenges in surrogate decision making, which uh, goes across the lifespan from the very beginning to the very end. And we'll talk about approaches to studying this. Um, on our panel, we have uh, three different speakers. I'll allow them to introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Samir Gadapali. I'm a, a pediatric surgeon at uh, University of Michigan, focusing on decision analysis. Uh, my um, actual uh, thing is actually I am very closely collaborating with uh, a group called the NEC Society, which uh, focuses on uh, illness in newborns, which has a devastating impact on uh, families. So without further ado, uh, pass it. Good afternoon, I'm Bronson Tucker Edmonds. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist um, and a health services um, researcher at Indiana University um, where I'm an associate professor in the, our Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you all today to talk about surrogates and caregivers and decision making across the lifespan. Um, and uh, just for the sake of staying on time, I won't make a joke, but I may, might if I have time later. <laughs> I don't have any disclosures. Um, any, um, to, uh, I don't have any disclosures. Um, so what we'll do today, um, I, am, I will say I'm a little bit nervous. They, we started off with sort of eight to nine minutes, and I was like, it usually takes me that long to explain what periviability is. But um, <laughs> I'm going to just start to try to give you some context for, um, to define and describe periviable care. Um, that's my primary area of research. Um, I study shared decision making in high risk of obstetrical settings. And this is a particular um, context um, that is both um, ethically fraught and, um, and challenge medically challenging. Um, so we'll spend some time laying that out. We'll then characterize surrogate decision making um, in periviable care. Um, and then um, we'll spend sort of the last couple of slides um, where I try to distill uh, sort of the, the information that we've been able to gather over the last two or three years in working with um, patients and parents um, to understand um, how we can improve the counseling and decision support for surrogate decision making in this setting. Um, so, uh, just to try to orient you to periviable care and periviable decision making, um, if you could imagine um, that you yourself or your partner or someone that you love um, is 23 weeks pregnant when they break their water. Um, at that point, um, the, your, their provider um, is going to explain to them that they're, they're basically at, at very high risk of delivering an extremely premature um, neonate. Um, we know that 50% of women who break their water are going to deliver within the next 48 hours. Um, so there's some time pressure that that immediately places um, in context. Um, and we also know that like 80% will deliver within the next two weeks. And so we're talking about an early delivery most um, any way that you slice it. And what's important to understand in this particular window of pregnancy, the periviable window, is that even with intensive care, most of these babies won't survive. Um, those that do survive, roughly half of them, will grow up to have moderate to severe disabilities. For those of you who need to see the numbers, we just came out of a session talking about the role for numbers. Um, if you're focusing on the second to last column, there are 23 weekers. And if we sort of take it all together, we're looking at 84 out of 100 babies born in that window um, that are born, that are either, either die or live with moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment. Um, but that leaves us with 16% um, that end up with normal to mild impairment. Um, and then you also will, may note with this figure um, that things are changing pretty dramatically in the way of survival and impairment um, as you move across each of these weeks. And there's a degree of uncertainty even around how we date people in pregnancy. So there's not a lot of certainty about, you know, are you exactly 26 and 2? Are you exactly 22 and 1? Um, so this is a setting where there's significant uncertainty and there's a lot of complexity. Um, I haven't even gotten into describing some of the outcomes related to cerebral palsy, et cetera. Um, but it's um, a situation that's fairly um, fraught. Um, and so in that setting, um, there becomes this um, 
this moment um, in which uh, providers, um, typically though not always, um, are actually going to turn the choice to you um, as the parent. Um, you're given the choice that in light of the uncertainty, in light of the high risk for mortality and morbidity, um, that you're given the choice as to whether or not you would want to resuscitate or make an attempt at life support, um, supportive care or pursue palliation, which we call comfort care, um, recognizing that that would lead to, um, to, to death in this window. So this is how I paint the picture for you for what peri-viability is and what peri-viable -vi decision-making entails. It's a window that's defined at 20 to 26 weeks of gestation, um, marked by high risk of death, disability among most of the survivors, and um, this putting parents in the position of making end-of-life decisions at the very beginning of life is how I usually characterized it. For the purposes of this talk today, I think it's important to think a little bit about how um, surrogate decision making at the end of life differs a bit from surrogate decision, sort of end of life decision making at the beginning of life. And I think one of the key principles that we usually hold surrogate decision makers to, the standard, is that of substituted judgment. So we're usually um, asking the third party individual when we're looking at an, um, the end of life with an elderly or terminally ill patient, for them to determine what the individual would have chosen were they able to decide for themselves based on their personal values, the things that they loved, the way that they lived. You'll appreciate, though, in this perinatal setting where you're actually starting with this decision before you have a born child and actually having to intervene within minutes of life, that we don't have sort of the luxury, if you will, of using a substituted judgment standard. Instead, we are left primarily with best interests as sort of being the guiding principle when we're making pediatric decisions. And in that setting, we're asking, do the burdens of the proposed course of treatment outweigh the benefits? Um, now, for children sort of across the, the pediatric spectrum, a number of factors may factor into that assessment. How old are they? Um, the life expectancy with or without the treatment. Um, concerns about pain, suffering, risk, side effects. Um, and the extent to which they, they um, are currently disabled by, by their condition. We want to drill down thinking more specifically about peri-viable care, um, then I think that what really comes to the fore in these conversations um, as we try to understand the values that are playing is really a conversation about quantity of life and quality of life all, oftentimes with regards to sort of life expectancy with or without intervention, which of course with palliation would be expected to be on the scale of minutes to hours, um, versus the concerns about the potential for um, pain with interventions that may or may not um, lead to um, long-term survival and the potential for long-term survival that might also um, be afflicted with pain and suffering. And there's one additional standard that I think it's worth bringing to bear um, that plays out a lot in pediatric um, surrogate decision making that um, may be less so in elder care. Um, and that's really the harm principle. Um, and this is um, where um, parental decisions that place children at risk of harm, um, there's both ethical and legal um, sort of um, reasoning behind this that said, said that the state should um, interfere in those settings to protect children from those harms. Um, this is the basis for overruling parental decision and limiting parental discretion without getting into a lot of legal discussion about that. The reason I raise it is because um, I spent the first five years um, of my work in the peri-viable realm, really looking at how physicians make decisions, obstetricians and neonatologists, and noted some really important and interesting differences. I learned in, from studying my, my pediatric colleagues that this piece around harm, the harm principle, is um, very prominent in their sense of advocating for patients and, and protecting their patients, recognizing that their patient is the child, whereas on the obstetrical side of the dynamic, we have this sort of dyadic patient um, scenario. And so the reason that I think it matters um, with regard to this harm principle is that I think that's what's operating um, oftentimes with regard to when to the very narrow window in which parents are given discretion. Um, it, there's a 
basically between 22 and 25, 22 and 24, is really the window in which parents are allowed to kind of make a choice. And beyond that, they're not given options. And before, you know, sort of on either side, um, sort of the, the, the medical community has decided that, they, that there isn't a choice. Um, and there's reasons that we could have conversations about whether that should be if we really looked at the differences in terms of survival. But I think that it has importance because the work that I did early on showed us that physician values and institutional policies are often the drivers of decision making more so than parental preference in this arena. And I think um, a lot of that has to do with this harm principle. Um, and further, as we studied communication and counseling in this realm, we saw that discussions of goals and of care and contextual factors are really often absent. Um, we saw that providers don't routinely elicit preferences or engage patients in deliberation. Um, and we found that uh, values elicitation is almost always um, absent um, in the work that we've done to date. And so in the last two to three years, we really shifted our attention to try to figure out how can we improve that state of affairs and center patients, parents, families in the peri-viable um, um, decision-making process. Um, and so we um, have really turned our attention to what, what to studying patients um, and parents in particular. Um, and so what we've learned from patients, I'm just gonna share with you in these last sl few slides, um, come out of two of the studies that we've done. One which was conducted to qualitatively elicit advice from women who had experienced periviable birth in order to improve healthcare providers counseling and to optimize decision support. Um, the other is um, work that we've done over the course of about a year and a half. Uh, it was using a patient-centered design research methodology where we engaged panels of patients and providers, actually, to try to understand the attitudes and values and goals um, that drive resuscitation decisions. And then we were um, using that um, structure to co-design a decision support tool. Um, so what we've learned from patients when we ask for their advice, um, first and foremost, they um, ask that providers be empathetic. Um, you know, uh, one participant shared that, you know, if this is something that you experience a lot in re with regard to the doctors, they're kind of, you know, numb to the situation. Um, but they're asking us to treat every experience as though it's your first time seeing it. They've also asked for us to be realistic. Um, just let them know all of the bad things that could happen so that if they don't happen, it's good. But if they do happen, at least they were forewarned. However, in the face of asking for us to be realistic, um, it's not just the facts, doc. They want us to be realistic, but also hopeful. Um, and they say that they feel like there's an air like doomsday, um, like the babies were not going to make it. No one ever said that, but I felt like that. Um, you're hoping that you're just gonna ride that bed in the hospital for the next 12 weeks. Um, the nurses are phenomenal in that. We're gonna do it, and I think it's probably a little harder for the doctor to do so. Somehow, be on our team. Um, and their final um, sort of category or theme that arose in that work, um, really there was a fair amount of sharing about guilt and blame and asking providers to preemptively address um, what um, it seems is a fairly universal experience. Um, they say, you know, one of our participants shared, some days I'll, st <clears throat> I'll still pick up that bag of guilt, that mom guilt, like it's something I did. But a lot of times it's, well, medical things are beyond control and the guilt shouldn't be part of this journey because there's other things that consume you and the guilt should not. Um, so our take home messages, just sort of distilling that work, um, were to be empathetic and patient, factual but hopeful, and to address guilt and blame. Just our final um, um, set of um, things to highlight came from, um, this is uh, the patient advisory boards, uh, that second study that I noted where we worked with um, parents who had experienced periviable care with surviving children and with um, and bereaved parents as well, as, long, as well as expectant moms um, and providers. So we sort of did this stakeholder engaged effort in order to explore and co-design our tool. And I'm just gonna give you a quick snapshot of um, what they suggested or um, felt were important things, sort of the must haves and the can't haves in decision support um, tool development. And they felt that all the outcomes needed to be, uh, in, to be um, present, 
um, with comprehensive explanations, but then they return to those interpersonal aspects of empathy, um, making sure that a holistic picture of the child across their lifetime, um, and so into adulthood was presented, and that both quantity and quality of life were attended to. And then they felt really strongly that it's not our role to bias people or to be forceful in our recommendations to, um, they were sensitive to not exclude partners or support persons. Um, it couldn't be cold, impersonal, or unfair feeling and it couldn't make assumptions. And so um, in just four slides, I tried to distill about three years of work. Um, I think the conclusions that I um, think it really boils down to, at least what I feel like we've had the um, privilege to work with our partners and learn is that probability matters, um, that people do need to have a sense of what the outcomes are and do want that information, but possibility does as well. So it's been found again and again in the literature where people are trying to understand the values that parents hold, that hope matters, and they're looking for hopeful messages, that values matter, um, and we are um, continue to be concerned about the lack of values elicitation and values clarification and working diligently to try to fill that gap. Um, and that emotion matters, and that attending to the emotional well-being of moms and families um, is key in this endeavor. So I look forward to uh, discussing this further with you all. Hold uh, questions to the end. Good afternoon. My name is Sasha Delorme, and I'm from Regina, Saskatchewan. I'm pleased to be invited to this conference to share my experiences as being a caregiver to my seven-year-old son with type 1 diabetes and to my father who is 48 years old with a brain injury which left him incapable of making his own decisions. I'm going to tell you my story while a slideshow of photos of my family and our lives runs in the background. The photos won't necessarily match the part of the story I'm telling and this is because I don't take pictures of our struggles which is what I'm here to talk about today. I would also like to mention a quick backstory about my dad before I begin. I feel it's important to include this so that you can understand a little more about the man he was before the accident and why it's so devastating for our family. <clears throat> My dad grew up in a small town in Saskatchewan with four siblings and his parents. His dad was abusive and because he grew up in an unhealthy environment, he dropped out of school and left home at the age of 15. When he was 17, he met my mom. She was 19 at the time, a single mom supporting a three month old baby. As dad always told the story, he fell in love with me and then my mom. He moved in quickly and knew he had to support this new family he was creating for himself. Instead of getting a job at McDonald's or Dairy Queen like most kids that age do, he decided he wanted to build houses. So he asked family members and friends for their unused tools and once he had enough to fill a duffel bag, he started catching the bus, jumping job site to job site in hopes that someone would take him under their wing and train him. He did this for years and we struggled a lot. We finally moved to Regina when I was six, and this meant more job opportunities, and eventually my sisters were born. He built a reputation for himself and a strong name, and eventually he was building beautiful lottery homes, condos and apartments, and anything you could think of. This was because he never took a break, and he always pushed himself to be better. He worked harder than anyone I've ever known, and did everything he could to support our family when times were tough. He even made the national news one year because he was seen working outside, on a minus 52 degree winter day, and by the end of the interview they had said, Carmen Wintonic, tough as nails. This tagline stuck, and he was forever known as one of the toughest men around. He started out at the very bottom of the carpentry ladder and worked his way up with dedication and determination. He was my hero. Now fast forward to 2014, four years ago. My husband and I were newcomers to the world of type 1 diabetes in May 2014, and five months later, my father was in a motorcycle accident that changed our lives forever. We had no family history of type 1 diabetes or experience with being a legal guardian to a young parent, so we had to learn it on our own at a young age. This leads me to our biggest problem when it comes to being a caregiver, lack of support. Brayson was two, and his first pediatrician that he was assigned to after diagnosis couldn't help us with changing doses, making adjustments, and he couldn't tell us the basics of what we needed to know. He checked his injection sites and did blood work, but that was it. I had asked him for a referral to the pediatric endocrinologist's office in Saskatoon, a two and a half hour drive away, but he refused to do so because he said it was for complex issues with diabetes only. We had to learn everything ourselves by reading, joining Facebook groups for parents of children with type 1 diabetes, and eventually, two years later, 
I met a group of parents in my city and we started organizing meetings so that we could have a support in place. We have one pediatrician in Regina who shows a special interest in children with type 1 diabetes. Getting in to see her is hard because she now takes on all the children with type 1 at diagnosis. When we call the office to speak with her, we are told to email her and sometimes it takes days for a reply. It has now been over a year since we have seen her because we can confidently manage without help. She was the one to finally refer us to the pediatric endocrinologist. We have to travel two and a half hours to see him once a year, but we are very fortunate to have an amazing endo and care team. We don't have any sort of respite care to help families like ourselves for appointments or emergencies with our other children. Our family members do not know how to administer insulin, carb count, give glucagon for emergencies, or any other basic care associated with type 1, and this is due to the fear of possibilities if anything goes wrong. When Brayson is at school, we are able to see his numbers thanks to his continuous glucose monitor, the Dexcom G5. He has his cell phone with him and his EAs carry it along with his supply bag, and we communicate with each other via text using his phone. We text as needed throughout the day, some days more than others because of stubborn lows needing extra attention and guidance. I am not able to work away from home because of the amount of work we put into managing while he is at school, and the school hasn't approved any of the staff to give insulin needles, so I have to pick him up at lunchtime and bring him home to do his lunchtime management. Some of the issues with my dad have had. I had asked many nurses and hospital staff if there was any type of help for my family. Being 27 years old and never having dealt with this type of situation, I had no idea where to start or what needed to be put in place for my dad. I had one social worker at the hospital explain to me that he would have his medical needs taken care of, but we would have to make all decisions. He was in a coma with no brain activity, broken bones all over his body and face, a machine breathing for him, tubes and cords everywhere, and a metal sensor in his head to monitor the swelling in his brain. His back was broken and his spinal cord was severed. It was traumatizing for me, but I had to make the decision for a life-saving surgery based on a very poor explanation from a doctor. I felt like the doctor didn't take me seriously because of my age. Because dad was only 44 at the time of his accident and didn't have any type of benefits being a self-employed carpenter, he didn't have a written will or anything in place stating what he would have wanted in, this, in case of this type of loss. We were completely unprepared, and because we didn't have anyone to turn to that could guide us in making decisions, I called on my sisters, dad's, dad's sister and brothers, aunt and uncle, and his best friend for the hardest decisions. I included everyone I knew to be his closest relatives and when I needed help, and eventually it caused a lot of tension and resentment leading to breaks in the family relationships. Everyone wanted something different, and I eventually realized that I knew my dad the best and I could confidently make the best choices for him. My dad was left paralyzed from the chest down and with a brain injury leaving him incapable of making decisions for himself. SGI paid for a lawyer so that I could have a judge sign off on legal guardianship papers once he was deemed incompetent. I was to make all personal and medical decisions for him like I had been doing since day one, but this paper made it official and gave me the confidence when I had to deal with nurses and any other people who didn't honor my wishes. I had to sign a DNR paper, which was hard for me to do, but if he were to have a stroke or a heart attack that left him in worse condition than he's in now, he would be left with no quality of life. I've had to keep in close contact with SGI and his public guardian and trustee throughout these last four years because they pay for his medical expenses, housing, and any other needs. He has a van which was customized to fit his wheelchair, but this has been both a blessing and a curse. Having a brain injury has left my dad very mean and most days difficult to get along with. When my family isn't able to take him out, he becomes aggressive, and this has put major stress on myself and my other family members. When it comes to making decisions for my son and my dad, there are some similarities and some differences. It's easier to make choices when it comes to Brayson because as his parent, I had been doing so based on his needs and the needs of our family. He was and still is too young to make decisions for himself. Some of the biggest decisions we face as caregivers of a child with type 1 diabetes are multiple daily injections versus an insulin pump. Brayson is taking multiple daily injections because we have learned so much over the years and have become experts in his management that we almost fear a tra transition to a pump because it would mean starting back at the beginning. We know with a pump there would be the advantage of not needing six to seven needles a day, but his safety and routine are more important at this time. Whether we send him to school and trust that he is taken care of adequately and safely, or whether I keep him at home and homeschool. We have chosen to send him to school, and with that comes the responsibilities of training his teachers, EAs, principal, and any other staff who come into contact with him. 
we have had to update guidelines and procedures, and as I had previously mentioned, keep in frequent, frequent contact and pick him up for lunch, or even run to the school to give a correction needle when he's running high. Being home is the best choice for our family at this time, until he's older and able to manage more independently. Some of the more difficult decisions I've had to make for my dad are signing the DNR paper at his nursing home, moving him from the Wascana Rehabilitation Center to a smaller care home in his hometown. He wasn't able to do the rehab because he was in too much pain. He had said he wanted to move back to his hometown so he could be around family who lived there, which meant packing everything up and moving him two hours away from the best place for him. I had to keep in contact with his nurses and we had to make trips out there to visit him when he got lonely. He wasn't there for a year before we moved him back to Regina. Being away from my family and sisters, he became depressed, angry, he stopped eating and drinking, and his overall health declined. Once we moved him into his third care home, we saw an improvement in his memory, communication, eating habits, and attitude. The, the last couple months, oh, sorry. This lasted a couple months, and then he wanted to move yet again. So I arranged to have him transferred to yet another facility where he has been for the last eight months. Our family believes he will never truly be happy because he can't live alone or take care of himself, and some days he believes that he can. Over the years, I've struggled with deciding for dad and allowing him to decide. When he wants to make a decision about his care that puts his safety at risk, I step in and have to make the choice for him. He gets mad and abusive, and it adds stress to my family. There have been some nurses who have kept him in the dark when it comes to his health and updates, and it makes him aggressive and angry because he feels like he should be in charge of his own life. He doesn't understand the extent of his injuries, especially the brain injury, so it can be hard to explain to him why I have to make certain decisions for him. We have had some very poor communication with some of the nurses and care managers over the years in the different facilities he's lived in. We have recently come up with a good system at his current residence that seems to work. They will call me with the bigger issues and we will figure out if it is something we can handle without him knowing or if we feel that he should be included, we'll have a meeting with him so he feels like he has some say. Sometimes he just needs to be heard and to feel his opinion is taken into consideration. The first two years were the hardest for myself and my family. I went through the stages of grief, and because I have an amazing family and support system, I was able to overcome the depression. I mourned the loss of our normal life before the diagnosis of my son, and the motorcycle five months later that left my dad, the toughest man I've ever known, like a fifth child for me to take care of. I've lost the dad I knew for 27 years of my life, and I've finally accepted this new man who took his place. Type 1 diabetes changes your whole world. It brings a fear into your life that never leaves, and you can't take a break from it when you need it the most. My husband and I felt so alone because no one understood our struggles. I lost sleep and I had to go on antidepressants at one point because I couldn't get through the day without crying. I found a doctor who took me on as a patient in 2017 after living with high stress for three years. When he did my initial blood work and checkup, we realized I have hypertension and borderline type two diabetes. My first visit with him, I had very high blood pressure readings and the nurse debated whether or not to send me to the hospital that day. I felt very horrible and had been living this way for years, so I didn't realize how unhealthy I was. Chronic headaches, muscle pain, fatigue, kidney damage that my doctor said he hasn't seen in anyone my age, uh, a severe vitamin B deficiency, severe hives that warrant, warranted a bone marrow biopsy to rule out rare diseases, the list goes on. My point here is that when you're a caregiver, you put your own health and needs on the back burner and the needs of whoever you're responsible for come first. Someone once said to me when I was going through an especially hard time, how do you expect to help your family when you're running on empty? Take time for yourself or you won't have anything left to give. This has stuck with me. Caregivers give and give, and when there's no outside support, burnout happens. It's very real and it needs to be addressed and taken seriously. Having someone outside of family, such as a therapist or social worker who is there to help families like my own affected by a chronic illness or disability would make a huge difference in our life. We need guidance, suggestions, resources, and sometimes we just need to be heard and appreciated. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my story. I'm Alexia Torkey. I'm a palliative care physician and researcher at Indiana University um, at the Center for Aging Research. Um, I'm just delighted to be on this panel, um, and I think what I what I hope to do, I feel like the um, the last talk illustrated just the lived experience of of caring for both an adult and a child, 
Um, and I want to um, flesh that out with some research evidence. Um, but I think what you've heard is really the most important part, which is you know, what it's actually like to live that experience. So today I'm gonna cover four topics. Um, Decision-making capacity from a lifespan perspective, communication with patients and surrogates or caregivers, and then, because unfortunately our, for, our fourth panelist was unable to join us do, do, for a health issue, I'm going to describe a study done by Doug White and colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh called the Partner Study that addressed surrogate decision making in the ICU. And finally, I'll talk about advanced care planning. My colleagues and I developed this framework when we were grappling with the issue of informed consent in studies of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. So as, as you know, Bronson started with before birth and gave us a framework for parental decision making. Um, but I'll start with birth on the left of the diagram, um, although I think many of the same principles hold. Of course, very young children cannot participate in a complex cognitive process such as medical decision making. So we rely on a model of parental consent. And as she told us, it's based on a concept of best interest. As children age, they, gave, they gain cognitive function and judgment as shown by the, the increase in the light blue triangular area. At some point, they have enough of the elements of decision-making capacity that we believe they should play a role in the process. This is shown by the solid blue line. We operationalize that role in medical decision-making through the concept of assent, in which the child must provide an affirmative endorsement of the treatment proposed. Sometimes this is written, but most often it's verbal but the child's capacity is only partial, so parents must still provide permission. When a child reaches the legal age of majority, as shown by the dotted line, they now have the right to make decisions on their own. Let me pause for a moment to, describe, to provide a brief definition of decision-making capacity, although a, an in-depth conversation about this is beyond the scope of this panel. So decisional capacity is the ability to make a particular medical decision at a particular time. So it's not general ability, it's specific. Applebaum and Grisso have given us a list of some key elements, which include the ability to understand information, to reason, to appreciate the consequences of a decision, and to make a choice. So now looking to the right side of the diagram, if an, if an adult develops a condition such as Alzheimer's disease, we begin to see a decline in cognitive function um, that's reflected here. However, we often give adults decision-making authority even as their cognition declines. This may be for a couple reasons. First, we have an assumption in a free society that adults have autonomy until proven otherwise. In other words, we have a high bar for taking away a person's right of self-determination. Second, it has been documented that clinicians actually tend to overestimate decisional capacity so we may give authority to adults who lack capacity without even realizing it. But somewhere along the line, the deficits become apparent and we bring in someone else to make decisions who we call a surrogate or proxy decision maker. For a period of time, the patient and surrogates are both included in decision making in various ways, leading to triadic decision making and communication. At the end stages of dementia, the patient once again is completely unable to participate and all decisions fall to the surrogate. Now, as you would imagine, this model could be shaped very differently for different types of clinical situations. There may be a sudden decline due to an ICU admission or, for example, a brain injury. Of course, caregivers are present at all stages of the model. A parent for a young child, a spouse for an adult with cancer who has full decisional capacity, or an adult child for someone with impaired capacity with something like Alzheimer's. So we think of the capacity of the patient as one factor that will affect the nature of triadic communication and decision making. This model by Wolf and Roeder describes the triadic relationship with the patient, provider, and the third party in the center. Their model includes three core components, relational support, which includes concepts such as trust, empathy, and then information exchange regarding health systems, decisions and values, and finally, decision making. And I think the prior two speakers illustrated each of these concepts, um, and I'll illustrate them further with respect to adult, adults um, with, who, who, have, who, need, who require caregivers. You can also see that this communication takes place in a variety of settings, the outpatient, the hospital setting, and is affected by patient, family, and provider factors. There have been a couple of great reviews of triadic communication in adults with full capacity. 
Um, first, overall, bringing someone to a visit is more common with older age and lower in physical and mental health, not surprisingly. The companion might play multiple roles, logistical support, just getting there, listening and providing information, and then providing emotional support to the patient. Of course, this kind of communication um, presents challenges, including patient family disagreements about the role of the caregiver or about the decisions, disclosures that are unwanted by the patient, and these may be disclosures by the family member to the clinician or by the clinician to the family member, and increased complexity and length of visits. So going back to some of the components of the model, um, I'll first talk about information, and two of the papers I'll present rely on a theory developed by my colleague at Indiana University, Sandra Petronio. Communication privacy management proposes that individuals perceive boundary around private information, so there's a metaphor of boundaries, and they feel ownership over their own private information. As a result of this ownership, they get to choose whether to reveal or conceal information. And conflict may result from differing assumptions about the rules of disclosure by the individual and the people around them. They conducted interviews of 123 informal caregivers of patients with normal cognition and identified some key themes, and I'll show you one of these related to information. Caregivers felt a tension between protecting the patient's privacy and enhancing the patient's well-being by revealing information. So in this quote, the caregiver says, I interrupted politely and told them the correct information. One finding of the study is that when forced to choose, caregivers revealed information to the clinician when they thought it was important for patient well-being. And this was sometimes a source of tension between the patient and their advocate. In another study, in the inpatient setting, we conducted interviews with 35 surrogates for hospitalized older adults. First of all, we found that the surrogate had the expectation that they would have full access to information about the patient and often had to struggle for that information. This one said we didn't always seem to catch the doctors in there. They seemed to get there either super early or at times maybe when we weren't there. I only interacted with her main doctor, I think it was once from her main team. On the other hand, clinicians felt comfortable demanding information. So as this surrogate said, you have to repeat everything multiple times and it's kind of frustrating because you would think that they would just read their medical records. I felt like a tape recorder. So in summary, patients and advocates have differing assumptions about revealing private information and their role in the visit. Physicians and surrogates each feel entitled to full information yet struggle to meet the other's expectations for information disclosure. Next, I'll show you an intervention study by Wolf and colleagues that was designed to improve triadic communication by encouraging the patient and their advocate to set a shared agenda. This uses a brief pencil and paper checklist that you can see here. The checklist asks the patient and companion to consider the role the companion will play and to list issues important to each of them. This was judged to be helpful and easy to use and, and led to improvements in patient-centered communi communication by the physician, defined as a higher proportion of psychological and socio-emotional elements of communication. So there is the potential to improve information sharing in the context of the triadic relationship. Another important theme was emotional support. Our, the patients in our study of surrogates gave compelling examples of both receiving and having unmet needs for emotional support. So here's a good example. Taking the time out to really sit there with me to explain that to me. That meant a lot to me, because some doctors, they will tell you and explain it to you, and then they move on. I felt like she really cared about what was really going on with my mom. Based on these findings and other literature on the role of cognition and emotion in decision making, we proposed a theoretical model. We proposed two dimensions of communication that influence the quality of medical decisions made by surrogates and clinicians, and both communication and decision making impact outcomes for both patients and surrogates. We then conducted a study to evaluate some of the relationships between these variables. So our study included, um, it doesn't, we don't have the number up there, but it's 364 patients and surrogate dyads, and the uh, patients were 65 and older and unable to make decisions and had a legally authorized surrogate. The surrogates rated communication and decision quality during hospitalization. For communication quality, we used a measure we've previously developed called the Family Inpatient Communication Survey, and we used the decisional conflict scale and specifically the effective decision subscale. Six to eight weeks later, we re-evaluated we re um, the surrogates using anxiety, depression, and satisfaction ratings. I'll just show you a few of the findings. 
So first of all, we looked at the association of communication with decisional conflict and satisfaction. Um, as you can see here, we found that, inf that emotional support, but not in information, was associated with, um, it, it, with ratings of effective decision. And we did this for the most difficult decision that the surrogate faced. In contrast, information, but not emotional support, was associated with satisfaction for care. Moving on to anxiety and depression, this table shows logistical regression with separate analyses for anxiety and depression. In this case, each analysis controlled for the demographic and other variables, as well as for baseline anxiety or baseline depression in the respective models. So as you can see, emotional support, but not information, was associated with anxiety with an odds ratio of 0.65, and the pattern of results is similar for depression. So in summary, both information and emotional support are important elements of surrogates between communication and clinicians that are associated with outcomes. Now, of course, the study is observational and cannot prove causation, and our study was not able to address the effects of communication on outcomes for patients, but others have. Now I'll shift to presenting um, Doug White's recent trial of a family support intervention that was published in the New England Journal recently. And please bear with me, I'm gonna do my best to do justice to this great study. Um, and he, I'm sorry that he wasn't able to be here on our panel today. The overarching question was, can outcomes be improved by instituting a protocolized family support intervention delivered by the existing interprofessional ICU team? There are three parts to the intervention, a protocolized family support pathway, advanced communication skills training for the nurse, and an intensive implementation support process. It was conceptually grounded in the cognitive emotional decision-making framework, which proposes that medical decisions are affected by cognition and emotion. This may seem familiar by now. And it therefore follows that interventions must address both of these components. This figure shows the activities of the partner nurse in the family support pathway, and I'll just highlight a couple things. On day one, the nurse provides emotional support and orients the family to the ICU. Within 48 hours of enrollment, a family meeting is held. The nurse both addresses the emotional aspects of the surrogate's experience and elicits concerns and questions using a checklist, which you see here. Each partner nurse underwent 12 hours of training by an expert educator, including didactic instruction, skill demonstration, and expert feedback. There were intensive efforts to, implement the, to support the implementation of the project, including support by leadership, identification of champions in each unit, academic detailing, and on-site implementation support by a quality improvement specialist. The trial design was a multi-center, stepped wedge, cluster randomized controlled trials in five ICUs in the University of Pittsburgh Health System. And I'll take a little bit of time to explain this diagram. So time is shown across the top in the B1, B2, et cetera, time frames, and each ICU is listed down the side. So first, the ICUs are randomly assigned numbers one through five. At the beginning of the trial, B1, all ICUs are providing usual care. At the start of B2, the first ICU begins to implement the partner intervention. This means that all the patients admitted during the B1 period receive usual care, and all the patients in the B2 and beyond receive the partner intervention. At the beginning of B3, ICU2 begins the partner intervention, and so on. So by the end, all the, interven all the ICUs are, are implementing the intervention. To be eligible, Patients had to be 18 years and older and have a lack of decision-making capacity and one of three high-risk factors. They excluded patients who lacked a surrogate or were receiving only comfort-focused care. The outcomes were in three general categories, psychological outcomes, quality of communication and decision-making, and healthcare utilization, and the primary outcome was the hospital anxiety and depression scale six, six months later. All analyses were intentioned to treat, and pre -specified there was a pre-specified plan to assess for baseline differences. They used gener generalized linear mixed models with ICU and time as random effects. So if you look at this flow diagram at the top, you see that 1,420 patients met entry criteria and were included, and 11,006 surrogates agreed to six-month contact. Going to the bottom two boxes, 
in the control group, 501 surrogates completed the surveys and 308 patients in the intervention. There were some baseline differences between control and intervention groups at baseline. The patients in the intervention group were somewhat older and also had slightly higher acute physiology scores than the control group. There were no differences between the intervention or control groups on the hospital anxiety or depression scale or the impact of event scale at six months. The study did show higher quality of communication and higher family reports of patient-centered communication in the intervention group. Patients in the intervention group also had shorter ICU stays, a finding that was mediated by shorter length of stay for patients who died in the ICU. Patients in the intervention group also had lower overall hospital stays and lower costs. So as you can see into the second to the last row, the adjusted mean costs were about $32,000 for control patients and $26,500 for intervention patients. In contrast, the cost to deploy the intervention was only $170 per patient. Every study has limitations. There were some baseline imbalances between the arms, and the trial was conducted in a single region of the country. But in summary, a low-cost family support intervention delivered by the interprofessional ICU team did not impact surrogate symptoms of depression or anxiety at six months follow-up, but did improve surrogates' ratings of patient and family centeredness of care and quality of communication, decreased ICU and hospital length of stay, and decreased index hospitalization costs. I'll move on to my last topic. We cannot talk about decision-making for adults with impaired capacity without considering the topic of advanced care planning. And we define advanced care planning as a process of exploring, forming, and documenting a patient's preferences for their future medical care. It's very important to note that we now think of advanced care planning as a process and not as a form or a single isolated event. We often base it on the principle of respect for autonomy, which is based on alignment with our value of self-determination and control over one's own body. Traditional advanced directives were living, the living will in which people could indicate preferences for care and appointment of a healthcare representative or durable power of attorney for healthcare. When advanced care planning was first introduced, it was hailed as a solution to many problems in end-of-life care. Perhaps we thought it would solve all of them including the growing trend towards aggressive life-sustaining treatments that some patients and families did not want. Then there was a backlash. I love some of these titles, the accuracy of surrogate decision makers. It turns out they're not that accurate. Enough, the failure of the living will by Dr. Fagerlin. I love this title. And advanced directives, time to move on. And there were some really legitimate points in these criticisms. Few people have living wills in spite of major efforts to increase their use. There was a theoretical objection that we just can't make informed decision about in situations that we've never faced. They aren't available when needed. Fortunately, some, initiatives have, some of the new initiatives have learned from the mistakes of the past and are beginning to show excellent results. And I'll give you a couple of examples. First is respecting choices, a comprehensive multi-component approach to advanced care planning. It's systematic in the sense that it's integrated into the outpatient setting, the inpatient setting, the nursing home setting. It's multi-step across the disease trajectory with first steps, next steps, and last steps. There are evidence for effectiveness in La Crosse, Wisconsin, where it was developed, where they found that 85% of patients who did the process had an advanced directive at the time of death. It was almost always followed, and patients were less likely to die in the hospital. In Australia, they did a study based on respecting choices and found that patients' wishes were more likely to be known and followed, and family members had less distress. The Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, or POLST, is an, instead of a living will that's done in advance, is an actionable medical order that specifies current care and transfers across settings, such as from home to a nursing home or hospital to home. It addresses four types of decisions. Studies have shown high degree of contortance between the choices selected on the post form and care received at the end of life. And a current issue for ongoing research is the extent to which these choices are informed and reflect the true preferences of patients and surrogates. And finally, a website called Prepare, developed by Rebecca Sudori, that's based on a stages of change framework. This has been developed to work for low literacy populations with racially and ethnically diverse perspectives. And studies have found that the website use increased patients' engagement in advanced care planning and completion of advanced directives. So in summary, to have a successful advanced care planning, it has to be a multi-step process across the disease and across the healthcare system. 
There has to be high quality facilitation by a person or a website or some other mechanism. It's integrated into all parts of the healthcare system and it names and engages a surrogate decision maker. So I think our initial um, hope was kind of dashed, but I think there's really a second wave of advanced care planning that's learned from the past. If we can do this, we'll have outcomes including better decision quality and a reduction in unwanted medical care at the end of life. I'll stop there and we'll begin our question and answer period. First of all, I wanna thank our panel for uh, presenting. Uh, I'm gonna open up the floor for any questions you guys might have. While you guys walk up to the podium, um, maybe one of the first questions you guys can answer is, uh, as a dad, where do dads get involved in some of this decision making, and what if there's disagreement with moms? Wow, you feel like reading my mind. Just put in a grant about that. Um, <laughs> um, no, um, it's, a, it's a great question. I think it's one of the next questions that, uh, from the antenatal and perinatal decision making um, standpoint, um, we really have to attend to. I have a colleague at IU who does work around um, dads in pregnancy. I mean, we just did a review of the literature together uh, um, that was really looking at the ways that dads do tend to feel um, excluded and marginalized um, in the uh, pregnancy care arena. So specifically thinking about antenatal decision making, um, decisions about um, place of birth and things. And it's a little bit of a challenge from an obstetrical standpoint because we have um, kind of a woman-centered view of the world. Uh, I think you could argue rightfully so, but um, the literature also suggests that women oftentimes want their partners um, 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 dads and otherwise uh, to be involved. And so centering women also then means centering the people that they want involved in their um, decision making. So I think that there's work to be done in, um, in the obstetrical arena, I'll say. I think pediatric folks, and I recognize that I'm sort of a stand in to the left of a pediatrician, I think that they're farther along than that with regard to understanding the tri you know, um, how to center families. But really the literature would suggest that, um, that there's still a fair amount of work to be done there. Thank you very much. My name is Susanna Mushegel, University of Massachusetts. I have a question for Sasha, the caregiver. Um, I'm a neurointensivist, and I have a particular interest in shared decision making in the neuro ICU, especially in TDI. So patients like your father are my patients. So um, my question to you particularly is when your father was in the ICU, did anyone talk to you about goals of care? And now that you have the life, and he has the life he has, do you have any regrets, or are you are you very happy about the decisions you've made? And how do you, how do you think about uh, those things now? Um, so when he was in ICU, they didn't explain very much. I had to ask a lot of questions and like I'm, I'm good with asking questions, I'm not shy. So I got probably too much information at the time. But um, so it was kind of like an overload. And then I guess just from there, I decided everything based on what my dad would have wanted before the accident. And luckily we had had a bunch of conversations um, between us and our family. If he were ever in a position where he couldn't do anything for himself, what he would want. And I just kind of based all my decisions off of that and the person that he was before the accident. So I sleep very well at night because I know that I've done every or made every decision that he would have wanted before the accident. Yeah. No, no regrets. So hi, I'm Isabel Jordan, I'm one of the patient partners here. And Dr. Tucker Edmonds, I, I had some questions about, or a question, um, about the idea of uh, best interest of the baby and how that's framed. In our society, we have so much fear of uh, disability and being disabled. And I think we conflate pain and suffering with um, being afflicted. And uh, my concern or my question is when parents have to make these very quick decisions, um, probably they not have a lot of intersection with people who are disabled and what it means to have a life in disability and then they need to make these decisions. And in the medical system, they have a very, most physicians have a very medical model of disability rather than a social model of disability that people can have very full and rich lives and have uh, all kinds of disabilities. So I'm wondering how that's framed or whether it could be framed from people who live with disability as opposed to a medical model of disability and if you've come across that. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, central to the work that we do because we partner with 
families that have had periviable deliveries, um, and we find a range of people's experiences um, and a range of impairment and um, disability um, in their children, but also a range of perspectives about um, how they make meaning of that and what that means for their families and for their children. Um, and, and so um, I have um, been, um, I think, re-educated in a number of ways with regards to people for whom I would consider them, I would, and I think the medical, my colleagues who actually do the outcomes follow-up would assign, um, you know, profound um, sort of impairment as sort of the label that would be assigned as opposed to the way that it's perceived and conceived of and just talked about by their parents and things. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's very clear to me that the ways that we have, um, um, the medicalized approach that we take to um, 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 categorizing and labeling dis disability in this realm does not necessarily map to people's lived experience. And there's also a, a literature that I don't pretend to be expert in, but I am well aware of about how people um, think, you know, how, the ca how people recalibrate and how people with the lived experience of disability, um, you know, um, before and after have remarkable sort of ability to kind of recalibrate to their sort of satisfaction and, and quality of life. So I um, feel like I, that's very central to the conversations that we have in an ongoing way. I think what's interesting also is that in the patient, um, we have some work that we'll be presenting in a, um, one of the oral sessions tomorrow around some values clarification that we were doing in that space and um, that people tend to have fairly high thresholds for disability in uh, among the, the um, folks that we've engaged more than a hundred stakeholders at this point in these patient advisory boards that I was talking about and then um, this was a smaller, the R21 is a smaller kind of qualitative study so it's only 30 women but it, um, it was, it's still impressive. I think that, um, that um, you know, that's not really um, it is a factor. It's not necessarily the driving factor in the population that we care for. But what is very interesting and what I try to underscore is that our colleagues at UCSF who we partner with, they have um, almost 180 degree difference in a lot of their focus groups. And it is a very different population, socioeconomically, education, class, race, ethnicity, and the, um, the comments, the questions, the concerns, and what people, at least hypothetically, um, think that they would do in that space um, tend to be pretty different. So I think that there's regional difference. I think it's, there's cultural difference. I think that, I think it's a lot about centering the patient and finding out what their value is. But I do agree that our medical culture um, is probably probably not, you know, in lockstep with a lot of how a lot of people come to the table in terms of their perceptions and concerns around disability. Dr. Whitman, last question. Uh, Great. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three of the speakers. This was a really interesting panel. And I was reflecting on, I mean, Sasha did such a nice job of presenting the experience of being a caregiver to a young child and also to an adult. And um, I just wanted to toss a question do to Dr. Tork, um, because I think you presented these lovely, like some really nice thoughts and some lovely models. And I'm wondering if you have any closing thoughts for us about how being a caregiver or a surrogate might change along the lifespan, the lifespan of the caregiver or the surrogate, and also the lifespan of the person for whom they are caring or for whom they are a surrogate. Wow, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think, um, you know, as I was thinking about the diagram, I felt like I could talk about, I could have talked about it for an hour, and I'm sure you could too. As a child grows up, for example, they're going to want to have more autonomy. Um, there are going to be, you know, periods of time where a child wants growing independence and may want more independence than a parent is ready to give. Especially, in a, that's a, true in any family, right? But especially if the child has. A major challenge and then there's going to be a time when the child takes over the care of their condition um, and that's going to be a series of transitions um, you know hearing about someone with a traumatic brain injury there are going to be ups and downs um, people with brain injury may continue to regain some degree of function there may be changes over time and there may be setbacks and so navigating that um, I think one thing I heard Sasha say that I think is really important is that even people with impairment or even children who are not fully autonomous want to have a say in their own lives. Um, and I think that's so important. Even someone with a traumatic brain injury who requires a guardian wants to know about their day, wants to have a role in some of the decisions they face. And so when we're negotiating that triadic conversation, that's very important. 
Um, so for example, when I, I take care of a lot of patients with dementia, I address my questions to the patient and I address them to the caregiver. They both want to speak, and even if that patient is impaired. Um, a question that you've um, raised that I don't think has had as much attention is over the life of the caregiver. Um, so caregivers themselves, as you so eloquently described, experience um, aging and, he and health setbacks. They also are striving to meet their own life goals, that are some of which are separate from the people they love. Um, and so they have to find ways to take care of their health. Um, I, you know, I think one important thing that Sasha voiced was the importance of self-care um, and recognizing that that caregiver role is, of course, a crucial part of who a caregiver is. It, 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 I encourage my caregivers to not make it all of who they are. Um, and taking time for themselves, um, finding ways to have um, interests or a break when that's possible um, is incredibly crucial. And not to feel bad or guilty about, about having other needs. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things we're going to face as the population ages is that caregivers, both spouses and adult children, are aging as well. Um, and so, you know, I've certainly actually had patients in my practice where I'm taking care of a patient and um, her mother who are both over 65, and they're both facing challenges of aging. Um, and so, our care, of course, our caregivers age and face life challenges just like our patients do. Um, I'll close on one final thought, which is the issue that the ethical question of considering the caregiver as a person for whom we also um, deserve, who also deserves care. And how do we think of that caregiver? They're not exactly our patient, but they are a person that we care about. Um, and so we have an, I believe that we have obligations to our patient, to our identified patient, but we also have obligations to our caregiver um, to ensure that their well being as well. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs> we now have a break. If there's additional questions, feel free to come up. Thank you.